bit about non-surgical treatment, but once again, I think most people are here to learn more about the surgical treatment. Uh, in my opinion, that's by far the better treatment because uh, many times the medical treatment or non-surgical treatment doesn't really do the job. I think if someone has had gonochomastia for more than a year or maybe two at the most and still has the problem, it's not going to go away with anything other than surgery. And um, I think that can be supported in our literature as well, and I've certainly talked with other plastic surgeons who perform a lot of gynecomastia surgery, and, and that's pretty much the, uh, the, uh, the feeling of, of surgeons who do this type of work. Nonetheless, I would like to go over some of the medical treatments. Um, obviously, a non-surgical treatment would be compression of, the, of your uh, chest wall. Uh, most men with gynecomastia, if they haven't had surgery yet, are going to wear some type of compression shirt. Um, we have a picture here of one that um, can actually be used post-surgery as a garment, and I put all of my, uh, all of my gynecomastia patients post-surgery in some type of compression vest for a couple of weeks, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, a lot of people will wear some type of heavy compression like this just to mask uh, the breast appearance. Uh, I know that there are different companies out there that make shirts that are very tight for this purpose, Under Armour being one that's very popular now, so, and that's one a lot of my patients have worn in the past. Uh, but uh, aside from that, we can talk about medical uh, treatment for gynecomastia, and that's basically hormonal manipulation is what we're talking about. I, I do want to make a point, though, that at this time, there are no drugs that are FDA approved for the treatment of gynecomastia. That doesn't mean that they're illegal to use, and a doctor can certainly prescribe those, but none have been FDA approved to really uh, treat the disease. With hormonal manipulation or treatment, um, once again, uh, I mentioned this a minute ago, it may help during the first year or maybe the first two years of gynecomastia development, but after that, medical treatment hasn't really been shown to be that effective. Over some of the drugs that are used, and I have a lot of patients who have come in and they've uh, been treated with different drugs. Some have had some success, others not. Uh, tamoxifen is a very popular drug. It's an anti-breast cancer drug. For women who have breast cancer that is sensitive to, um, um, that's estrogen receptor positive, they are candidates for use of tamoxifen. As an anti-estrogen drug, it can tend to help, in some cases, shrink down the breast tissue associated with gynecomastia. Uh, clomiphene, uh, the, the trade name is Clomid. You may have heard of Clomid. It's, it's used in um, uh, infertility, in, in gynecology, as an infertility drug, and uh, it tends to bind uh, with estrogen receptors, thereby blocking the effects of estrogen. So that's sometimes used in gynecomastia treatment. Uh, men who are older, as I mentioned earlier, tend to lose testosterone levels, or, uh, and so uh, use of testosterone in some cases may be found to be useful in treatment of gynecomastia. And then these other two drugs listed here are also anti-estrogen drugs. Let's get into the surgical treatment, and uh, obviously I'm interested in that because I'm a surgeon, but uh, that's, like I said, I think the best uh, method for treatment once you've suffered from this for more than a couple of years. And there are different ways to address this. Um, you, can, you can directly excise the breast tissue. You can perform liposuction. Uh, and in my practice, I almost always perform a combination of the two, and I can get into that a little bit later. I, I'm concerned that a lot of people may not get the breast tissue removed with liposuction alone. Some people in my practice only need tissue excision because they may just have a small amount of tissue behind the nipple areola complex. And that can be remedied by making an incision on the underside of the nipple areola from about the 3 o'clock around to the 9 o'clock position, if you look at the nipple areola as a clock, obviously, and then uh, just lift up that tissue and remove the, uh, uh, the breast tissue underneath. But if it's any Thing larger than maybe a quarter or a half dollar, uh, you're probably looking at um, a little bit bigger operation requiring, if not sedation, then at least general anesthesia or twilight sleep. If you have a very severe case where you have a lot of extra skin, and we see this in primarily in older men or in men who are very heavy, you may actually need removal of all the breast tissue and the surrounding skin. And in a case like that, you preserve the nipple areola complex, but as a free nipple graft. So you actually remove it and then reattach it. And believe it or not, that's a way to kind of minimize scarring. Uh, if you preserve it like you do with a breast reduction, in women who have a breast reduction, you have more scarring than if you just take it off 
and sew it back on. And I'll show you a picture in a few minutes of a gentleman who, uh, actually a young man, he's only about 17 years old, but he was so uh, morbidly obese, he actually had to have that procedure with all the skin removed, all the breast tissue removed, and then he had for nipple grafting. So we'll get into that in a few minutes. So if you're thinking about surgery, you want to ask yourself, is this the right decision? Uh, is it right for me? Should I maybe go another direction, maybe go with medical treatment only? Uh, well, think about these different things. If it's, I, I think it's a good option for you if, if you're physically healthy and you're of relatively normal weight. Uh, it's, as I said, it's difficult to remove a lot of breast tissue and in someone who's really heavy or obese because they have a lot of skin uh, to deal with, and that can be done, but I think the ideal candidate is one who's not really uh, overweight. You also need to have realistic expectations, and that goes with any kind of surgery, whether it's a gynecomastia surgery or any other type of cosmetic surgery that I perform in my practice. If you if you're think you're going to look a certain way and that's never going to happen, it's not realistic because you just don't have that body shape, then maybe this isn't really for you. Uh, you're a good candidate, I think, if your breast development is stabilized, if you're not getting larger, if you're, if you're not having problems with um, uh, increasingly enlarging breast tissue. So if it's stable and, and, um, and you're in good, uh, good health, I think you're a good candidate for it. And obviously, you're a good candidate if it really bothers you that your breasts are too large. And that, that sounds like uh, being overly simplistic, but uh, there are a lot of men out there who are happy with that, who don't really mind that they have large breasts, and obviously surgery is not right for them. So the best candidate, to recap, is someone who uh, can't be treated with medical treatment. Uh, the medicine, if it's tried, just isn't doing the job. Uh, best candidate is someone who's healthy, obviously, and um, in my opinion, the best candidate is someone who is a non-smoker and a non-drug user. You want someone in optimal health, and uh, obviously I don't need to get into the um, talking about why smoking is bad for healing. It's, beyond the scope of this webinar, I'm sure, but, but um, you want a healthy uh, patient who's going to have the best chance in healing. And uh, you also want a patient who has the right attitude and has a positive outlook and that's a specific goal in mind. So a lot of patients, um, uh, let me preface this next slide by saying I spend um, a good bit of time writing on uh, gynecomastia.org website, and I, I think there are a number of men attending this webinar tonight that spend time on gynecomastia.org. I think it's a great site. It's a great forum for people who have uh, gynecomastia, and there are a number of men who have gone through surgery successfully and are very happy with their result, and they've spent a lot of time educating other men about their condition. Uh, so I think it's a great learning experience, uh, a great tool. So I, I kind of give out a shout to gynecomastia.org. I think it's a, it's a great website to visit for more information. And the reason I put this slide up is a lot of men on that site are specifically asking this, what do I say at the initial consultation? Uh, what should I be prepared to ask or to talk about? So uh, I, let's go through these quickly. Um, you need to talk to your surgeon about why you want to have the surgery and what your expectations are, what you're, you're hoping to achieve from this. And it may be unrealistic, as I said a minute ago. You want to make sure that you are um, – you're you're going into something that's going to give you the, the result that you want. It's important to talk about any medical condition you may have. Um, you want to enter into this with, in the best possible shape. If you have any kind of medical problems, medical diseases, obviously that's information you need to share with your plastic surgeon. Also, you need to share any drug allergies you might have, any kind of medical treatment you're on, medications you're taking at the time. Um, that's all important information to share with your doctor at the first consultation. Now, your surgeon at the consultation may also plan on evaluating your general health status. He or she should. Uh, there may be diagnostic testing that needs to be performed. Um, obviously, the surgeon will need to examine your breast and may or may not take photographs at the first consultation. Uh, I personally take those at the second consultation or at the second visit when the patient's already prepared for surgery and, and it's the pre-op visit where we have consent forms signed and things like that. Um, you're going to want to discuss your options with the surgeon. He or she may have uh, a different opinion than you have about what's best for you. So it's good to bring all that out in the open and ask uh, the surgeon his or her opinion. You're also going to have to have at some point before surgery uh, a long discussion about surgical risk and potential complications. Uh, obviously, no surgery can be performed without the potential for problems 
Uh, fortunately, with this operation, the, those uh, risks are rare. They seldom occur, but it's something, a discussion that needs to be made. And then, of course, the, the use of anesthesia. And every plastic surgeon has uh, a particular preference regarding how uh, a patient is anesthetized for this type of operation. Prior to surgery, there may be lab testing needed. Uh, in my OR suite, which is, as Matthew said, is accredited by Quad ASF, um, an EKG, for example, is required for anyone who's 40 years of age or older, um, regardless of the cardiac history. Uh, so that's something we need to do. And we, uh, Quad ASF is very rigid and has stringent criteria that, that have to be followed, and it's all about patient safety. So we get an EKG if you're 40 or over. You may have other lab tests that are required if you're on certain medications, but that's something that you can discuss with your plastic surgeon. Also, certain medications might need to be adjusted. Um, if you've had surgery, I'm sure you've been told uh, that there are a number of medications you need to avoid taking prior to surgery, particularly aspirin and any Aspirin-like drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs, or this class of drugs called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they can all inhibit platelet aggregation or platelet clumping, or basically in layman's terms, can cause bleeding, okay? So if you are on anything like that, I usually ask that you stop at least two weeks before and, and you not resume those until at least two weeks after. The same goes with herbal supplements. Many of those can lead to uh, bleeding after surgery. Special pre-op instructions are going to be given uh, prior to the surgery, and, and we take care of that, and Lisa helps coordinate that with the nurses in our office, uh, what to expect on the day of surgery. Uh, at the pre-op visit here, you'll get a packet of post-op instructions with uh, information on, on um, what to do, what not to do, kind of do's and don'ts, if you will, after the surgery. You'll get all that in advance. And because we have so many patients who travel here from out of state or out of country, uh, we often make uh, help out with travel arrangements, and Lisa is very good about that, and she's got a great relationship with some of the hotels here in Orlando and, and can get some decent discounts for patients coming in to have surgery. So what to ask your surgeon at your consultation? You're going to want to ask, obviously, discuss gynecomastia with the surgeon. Uh, he or she may have a different idea, as I said, than you do about how this should be handled, so it's important to talk about the surgical plan. Uh, what medications are you going to need? Uh, will you need stitches? Uh, will you need bandages? Uh, how long do you have to change bandages if, you, if they are dressed? What kind of garment will you wear? Uh, will you need to massage after surgery? So there are a lot of different things that need to be discussed prior to surgery. When can I resume normal activities? When can I resume exercise? When can I go back to work? Uh, and when do I come back here to the 